Welcome to the show, everyone. It is Tuesday here on Trekzone, which of course means it's talking science time. Dr. Brad Tucker is with me, Brad. Happy Tuesday. Yeah, how's it going? Really good. It sounds cold down there in Canberra. Oh, uh, yeah. We, we have pretty consistent weather of minus fours in the morning right now. So <laughs> At least at least it's reliable. It, it is very you know? it is it is perfectly reliable. It's cold <laughs> in here. So but everyone could feel the you know winter's coming as they say in game of thrones because all the politicians arrive next week <laughs> and of course uh winter's is winter a good time for uh some astronomy it is i mean usually the weather is more stable which means that um you you get less clouds the nights are much longer so you could see a lot you know backyard observing is also really great because all the planets are pretty much visible jupiter and saturn in the early evening or all night almost and Mars and Venus, and a little bit in the early morning, uh, and even a bit of Mercury. So it, it is kind of a good time of the year. And I, I think there's something special about um, rugging up and heading outside with your telescope and finding those planets and just staring at them and imagining what it would have been like all those centuries ago when, when these objects were discovered. Yeah, it is kind of, you know, everyone always says when, um, you know, we we're talking about the opposition of Jupiter, uh, Jupiter when it was kind of in a good alignment to be very bright, um, that, you know, you could see the, the moons of Jupiter. And it's like, well, you know, Galileo's telescope is only four centimeters wide. So, you know, if you have a, just a small instrument and a pretty dark sky, you could see pretty cool things. And one of the things that people have seen uh, with the aid of Cassini, uh, some of the final images have come through of, uh, of a planet that we can see uh, in the backyards uh, here on Earth, uh, Saturn's rings. That's right. And, you know, you could see the rings of Saturn with the small telescope. And so they've always, you know, the rings of Saturn have always fascinated people. Um, but what uh, Cassini shown, so Cassini was his probe. It spent over a decade um, orbiting uh, Saturn and doing, you know, amazing science. And so for its kind of final heyday, they did lots of skimmings of the planets flying really close. And um, one of the things that uh, they focused on was the rings of Saturn. And what they, the final images you started to see is that there was lots of like structure to the rings of Saturn. Now, we've always known there's gaps and there's chunks missing and there's bits and that's all related to doing the moons forming. But there was kind of like structure in the patterns in the in the rings. There was wavy patterns. There was these things called propellers. And so that it was a really you know, dynamically active area. One of the images that I liked was a stitched together uh, piece of Daphnis uh, and how it creates the gap uh, in the A-ring, which is really cool because it really looks like as Daphnis is orbiting around Saturn, it's creating these waves, as you say, all, all of these waves, and it's all stitched together and there's a there's a method to the madness almost. Yeah, it kind of, it does, yeah, that, I think that's a good way of putting it. It does feel like there's a method to the madness <laughs> and that in all these little moons, and, you know, there will be more moons discovered around Saturn because we can kind of see that there will probably be more moons around it and in all this little detail it's that there there is stuff to see and that there is more um, secrets that Saturn has to reveal yet Saturn's been visible with the naked eye for centuries well there's another thing where it's time to reveal the secrets and NASA is going to be firing an atomic clock into space uh, in the very near future well, so firstly, let's, what is an atomic clock? Well, so this is actually how time is measured now. You know, some people might think, oh, we still use astronomical time, the, the way the Earth spins in our day. But that's not perfect. In fact, we just passed the winter solstice in the southern hemisphere, shortest day of the year. But even though now the days are technically getting longer, sunset is still or sunrise is still going further back. So we're actually not getting earlier sunrises, not until about a week and a half. And that's actually because... If you imagine we're spinning, but as we're spinning on our axis a day, we're also moving around the sun. This actually creates very small imperfections in the length of our day relative to a certain point. And so the day is not 24 hours long uh, in terms of our spinning around. It's actually a bit longer in the winter solstice and a tad shorter in the summer solstice. So you can't use that as a way of 
time. And so the atomic clock is the international agreed upon way of saying what is time. And so we use a cesium atom and we have the cesium atom pulse and it does a certain amount of pulses. And that is the definition of one second and therefore the definition of time. How did someone come up with that? Who, who decided cesium? <laughs> so it's interesting. Um, I think, you know, there was a long process of looking at, you know, there's there's essentially international national institutes and standards bodies and they have these governing meetings. Um, you know, just a couple months ago, they convened to actually change the definition of a kilogram. Again, back in the olden day, the kilogram was there was a piece of metal held in this big, super French secret vault, and that was one kilogram. <laughs> but that's very arbitrary. And so everything's been trying to move to more physics space. And so now the kilogram is based on the definition of what we call uh, the Planck constant and some other calculations. And so early on, people were looking at, well, what atoms are available? How do we measure the pulses? And how do we accurately measure it to like a fine enough detail? Because one of the things is you don't want to say this is a second and need to start doing things quicker than a second or a millisecond or a millionth of a second, because then you can't improve our accuracy. And so I think the cesium atom pulse is something like 900 billion times per second. So if you can measure that, your resolution of time is one nine hundredth billionth of a second. Uh, and this is where it's important. It's important for things like space travel. And this is why NASA is launching an atomic clock in the sense that if you need to travel in space, your spacecraft or future astronauts, you need to know exactly when you are because a small difference in time will be a fairly big difference in speed and therefore fairly big in distance. And so that's like missing Mars by, you know, 100 kilometers. It's a pretty big deal. <laughs> Something that uh, has returned to Earth, or, or at least come down to Earth, is uh, the meteorite that uh, crash-landed pretty much right next to Trek's own HQ uh, here on the weekend. Yeah, so there was a, a lot of dash cam footage. In fact, it was quite funny. Someone said they were they caught it on dash cam and they were just coming home from watching uh, Men in Black. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and so, you know, it was another bright meteor. Australia's been, you know, there's been heaps of bright meteors over Australia the past eight weeks. And so it was about a, a meter size uh, meter, it looks like. Um, and again, another iron or nickel rich one. We see this with the blue green color. That's what it burns. Um, like one of the things I think has been interesting in all this is people always wonder, why are we seeing so many? And, and there's kind of a couple factors. One, it's the middle, you know, it's the middle of winter, so our nights are longer. It happened like at eight o'clock, I think. So, you know, it happened at, if it happened at eight o'clock at the summer mm -hmm. solstice, no one would have seen it. So, you know, it just happens that it was nighttime. And people have more photos and cameras, and so we're able to see these things more. And in fact, what I've noticed is that we get lots of reports of these, you know, big ones or even the smaller ones, but people have the footage so they could say, you know, I heard a weird sound and I saw a flashing light. 20 years ago, that was aliens. Mm -hmm. But now we can say, oh, no, that was this size of meter hit the Earth's atmosphere. That's the vibration you felt kind of blew up. And here's a bright flash. And so, in fact, I've noticed that as we as media reports have increased, UFO reports have decreased. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, uh, just very quickly, one last thing, Brad. I got into a bit of a discussion uh, on a Facebook group uh, over the weekend with someone adamant that this is the end for mankind uh, because this meteorite is very similar to the Tunguska event in 1908. Uh, can you help me disprove that, please? Well, so, so the Tunguska <laughs> event was this meteor. It was about. It was a meteor. It was about. I think they say it was about 100 meters. Exploded over the Earth's atmosphere and leveled a large part of the Siberian force. Of course, everyone said it was aliens when it happened. <laughs> That's the logical conclusion. You know, we all said, look, no, this is an asteroid that just exploded or a meteor that just exploded in the sky. And then 2013, a similar thing happened also over Russia. Things blow up over Russia all the time. <laughs> and so it's kind of like, well, you know, this was just one of those coincidences. And so what people are thinking of is there's this, this thing called a torrid swarm. And that is that it's kind of like a meteor shower, but there's leftover bits of large parts of a comet. Um, mm. The problem with that is the, the bits are still not that big. And even if so, all of it just burns up harmlessly in the Earth's atmosphere like we saw now. So I would say if they think the world's going to ending, I'm happy to hold on to their money if they really want. <laughs> Fantastic, Brad. Well, uh, thanks as always for talking science. And uh, I believe that you're going to come back on Friday. We're going to have a chat with Elizabeth Landau from NASA. Yep. It's a uh, lot's happening in a few weeks' time, so it should be exciting to hear about it. Very exciting, Brad. Look forward to uh, having you back on the show in a couple of days. And, uh, of course, for the Talking Science audience, 
We'll see you next week. Thanks, Matt. Trexo membership is getting even better as we roll past the middle of 2019. You'll now get extended cuts of the podcasts, starting with today's Talking Science, as well as exclusive behind-the-scenes info and access to premiere apps of the show ahead of the world. Jump over to patreon.com slash trexoneorgau. We're on Facebook with the wrap-up and Twitter with a live stream of events, plus Instagram with stories to tell and Trek episodes to relive. And, of course, here on YouTube and your favourite podcast platform. Subscribe, like, follow, all that good stuff. Leave comments. Let's have a chat. Oh, and don't forget to give this ep a thumbs up. As always, a big thanks to Brad. We'll catch him on Friday when we chat to uh, Liz in a Talking Science special. And also, don't forget, Brad's on social media. Find him on Facebook, Dr. Brad Tucker, Twitter, at BTucker22, or indeed, next week, right here on Australia's unofficial home of Star Trek, Trek Zone, with just 30 days to go until our Vegas or bust tour begins. Bye.